I mean, I think you know the famous example in the stimulus where like all the economists were like, make sure that people don't know you're getting them the, the tax credit because if they know that they're getting it, then they're not going to spend it. And it's like, no, make them fucking know so they know to vote for you again instead of the people who are going to give all the money to corporations. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. So if you've been uh, paying attention to politics recently, particularly the midterm elections and the candidates in different races, you may have noticed there's a phrase that started cropping up more and more. And what's interesting about it is it's cropping up on the Democratic side. You're hearing Democratic candidates talk about it. You're hearing them get asked questions about whether they support this particular policy. And you're also hearing Republicans talk about it a lot. In fact, the president loves to talk about it. It has become one of his new favorite things to talk about. And the phrase is abolish ICE. Abolish ICE. ICE, of course, is Immigration Customs Enforcement. It's part of the Department of Homeland Security. And it has been involved in lots of the really awful stuff we've seen in immigration policy in the Trump administration, most clearly family separation, right? ICE has been the unit that's um, doing the separating, uh, that's overseeing and implementing the policy. They've also been doing raids in gardening stores in suburban Ohio where they roll through and they handcuff a bunch of women who are, you know, working without papers and haul them off. They There's viral videos of them rolling up out of nowhere, unmarked, not with any badges or not even identifying themselves and trying to sort of apprehend people and people freaking out. There's lots of reasons that people have started to get really wary of ICE as an agency and what it does. But abolish ICE... Abolish ICE as a phrase and as a political platform sounds radical. It's like when I first heard that phrase, I was like, abolish. Someone's got to enforce the immigration law or you to get rid of it. Part of it is that word abolish. It calls back to abolition, which is a radical movement, a correct radical movement. Um, people that work to get rid of the death penalty call themselves abolitionists. Radical organizers who want to get rid of prisons altogether call themselves prison abolitionists. So there's a kind of radical bite to that phrase, abolish ICE. But what's also really interesting about abolish ICE as an idea is that the more I thought about it, the more I was like, well, it's not that crazy. I, I'm not sure I agree with it, but my initial reaction that like, well, you just can't get rid of ICE. ICE has only existed since after 9-11. It was created in the wake of 9-11. And what it did was it put together essentially civil enforcement matters and criminal ones in the same place. And interestingly enough, when people defend ICE, when ICE itself defends ICE or when they – it's all about them doing criminal enforcement. It's like, well, how can you get rid of ICE? ICE just busted a big sex trafficking ring. And it's like, yeah, you can bust a sex trafficking ring without an immigration-dedicated law enforcement entity. If someone is sex trafficking, guess what? They're breaking the law. Immigrant or non-immigrant. If someone's dealing drugs, breaking the law. Immigrant or non-immigrant. If someone's killing someone in a gang, that is illegal. That is a crime. You can bust them, and you should, if they are killing people through the various law enforcement agencies we have. You do not need a law enforcement agency dedicated to immigrants to do that. In fact, what's perverse about putting them together is that you end up with a culture that's all geared up to go after bad guys that kill people or traffic people, being the same ones who roll up on the moms working in the garden store, which maybe is not the greatest thing. So abolish ice as an idea was a phrase that I first heard and was like, ah, and it's grown on me a little bit. It's also grown on the Democratic Party. This idea, which started, and we're going to get to where it started in a second, wait for it, this idea has now been endorsed by a whole bunch of Democratic candidates. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib in Michigan, the senator from New York, Kirsten Gillibrand, has basically come out. Mark Pocan, who's a Democratic representative from Wisconsin, has introduced legislation to get rid of ICE, to abolish ICE. There's like legislation for this. And a year ago, the, you couldn't find the phrase. You couldn't find the idea. It was nowhere. No one was running on it, for God's sakes. No one even thought about it as a thing. No one was asking Democratic candidates because it did not exist as an issue. That is what's so fascinating about Abolish ICE. It was not an issue, and now it is an issue. And there's nothing more powerful in politics than the power to define what an issue is. Right? What's an issue? Property taxes. Property taxes are an issue. If you're having a debate about property taxes, 
you're already setting the terms of what a campaign's going to look like. If the first question in a moderated debate for a local elected representative is about property taxes, already all kinds of political boundaries have been defined, right? What is fascinating and dynamic about the political moment we're living in is the terrain is moving very quickly about what are issues, and it's changing. And the way that the left, particularly right now, is thinking about what the issues are and how to address them are changing very quickly and in really, really interesting ways. Which brings me to today's guest, who's a guy on Twitter named Sean McElwee. He's more than that. I'll get to that in a second. Who was sort of the person to popularize the phrase abolish ICE. It originated with immigration activists, groups that work with immigrants every day. But he started tweeting about it every time a bad ICE story would come out. Retweet, abolish ICE. He's got a T-shirt that he photographs himself in. Abolish ICE, abolish ICE, abolish ICE. He throws this, like, salon cocktail thing where a bunch of lefties, like, from kind of across the spectrum from, like, sort of progressive Democrats to, like, hardcore, very militant socialists come together. (laughs) And he has placed himself in a really interesting way at the nexus of the building of this new left, this kind of vanguard within the Democratic Party coalition, you know, these are folks that belong to the Democratic Socialists of America. They have red roses on their Twitter handles. They want ideas like Medicare for all, free college for all, a public option for banking, abolish ICE, all kinds of new ideas, all kinds of new issues, all kinds of new terrain being formed in real time right now by this part of the Democratic Party. It's not the biggest part of the Democratic Party coalition at all. It's not the dominant strain of the Democratic Party coalition at all. It has the highest velocity in an ideological sense of any part of the Democratic Party coalition. It is pushing and creating agenda spaces more than other parts of the party. And that hasn't always been true. There's a period of time back in the Clinton years when the DLC, which was the centrist part of the party, they were the ones at the forefront of creating new issues. They were the ones at the forefront of creating new policies. They were sort of leading the conversation. Not true right now. It is the left part of the Democratic Party coalition. But if you're looking for where the ideological energy is in the Democratic Party coalition right now, this is the part of the faction that has it. And Sean McElwee is a fascinating guy because he has sort of placed himself at the center of a bunch of different networks between the kind of establishment of the Democratic Party or or the sort of structure of the Democratic Party, the sort of vanguard of the, the Democratic Socialists of America... And he's got his finger on the pulse in this sort of freakish way of this part of the movement. And I'll give you an example. He tweeted this on May 6, 2018, months ago. I'm going to be roasted endlessly for this, but I don't care. If the Democratic Party has a Cantor moment, meaning Eric Cantor, who was in leadership in the Republican Party and got beaten in a primary out of nowhere by a guy named David Bratt, took everyone by surprise. If the Democratic Party has a cancer moment, it will occur in New York 14. What is New York 14? The district where Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez beat Joseph Crowley, who is in Democratic leadership, who took most of the political world completely by surprise. This is Sean McElwee saying this back in May. Everybody that woke up the next day and was like, who is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Sean McElwee was like, I am telling you, this is coming. This is happening. He then... <laughs> He then appended it with another tweet. He said, for what it's worth, I think Massachusetts 7 might surprise folks, but it wouldn't be a Cantor moment, more of a Bennett moment. Let me decode that for you. Bennett was a senator from Utah who got unseated, again, shocking everyone, back during the Tea Party years by Mike Lee in Utah. Didn't He was an incumbent senator, been there for years, kicked out by his own party in favor of a young, more ideologically right candidate, right? That's, that's the Bennett... And Massachusetts 7, what is that? That's a district where Ayanna Presley just won over Mike Capuano. Right now, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ayanna Presley are on their way to being members of Congress. They don't they have token Republican opposition. Um, when when I talked to Sean, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had won. Ayanna Presley was still yet to happen. So just keep that in mind when you hear us talking about it. So just to be clear, back in May, Sean McElwee is out here saying these two people. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, running for Congress in their own party's primary against great odds, women of color with a very progressive agenda, they are going to win. They're coming for you. Months and months before, I think, the mainstream political press woke up to what was happening. And that is because 
of Sean's proximity to all that's happening in this part of the Democratic Party coalition. And so as we head towards the midterms, we think about the future of the Democratic Party, where it is headed. I thought a great person to talk to is Sean. A few things about Sean. He's a contributor to the nation. He started this thing uh, called Data for Progress. They put out these sort of interesting empirical um, analyses of different policies and different political questions. He's also a really uh, p- profane. <laughs> like, he really likes to curse. So this is an explicit podcast, which is weird, but it is if you're just riding around with your kids in the car or you're playing it in your kitchen, just like FYI. I don't curse. Uh, I mean, maybe once or twice. Just get pulled into it. But um, and so, but here's here's the thing I would say. Whatever your politics are, where you place yourself in the political spectrum, even if you're a conservative, like you need to know to understand where American politics are right now, and particularly the forces that are going to shape the next presidential primary and the next agenda of democratic governance, if and when Democrats reclaim control both of national governments and when they are governing in states, the ones they have majorities like California, and in states they may take majorities. If you want to understand the vector of change, which way the wind is blowing, which way the movement is moving, you need to listen to folks like Sean McElroy. How old are you, Sean? Uh, 25. You're 25 years old. You're someone who, I don't know how you came into my awareness. You email me? I thought it was Twitter. Maybe Twitter. It was probably Twitter. I thought I just harassed you on Twitter. You harassed me on Twitter, which is not does not make you stand out. <laughs> but some harassment's more effective than others. <laughs> You've been sort of hosting this um like happy hour in yeah. in New York. What is the deal behind the happy hour? Like what's the idea behind it? Yeah, I mean when I came to New York and it was like interested in politics, like that was before being socialist was like cool. It was actually quite nice. You could show up to a Verso party like an hour late and still have seating. Now you're like an hour ahead of time. And you're in a fucking like third overflow room. Um, wait, am I allowed to say the F word? You can say whatever you want. All right. Yeah. I went, and one of the things I've noticed when I've been more on the record was I didn't realize how much I, I swore. And so like, I don't know, it was like the only left place you could go was like book launches and stuff. And I wanted to have like a place where, you know, people across the progressive spectrum could you know talk and find common ground and like at the time twitter was like a hellscape and wasn't really giving us spaces to talk in sort of good faith and sort of build the relationships that we need i'm not saying that the left can't have disagreements we just have to have them i think better uh and more effectively and it sort of just you mean, sort of grew. You, when when was it because yeah i i felt like there's a there's a way in which every sort of philosophical ideological doctrinal debate on the left on twitter becomes a flame war extremely quickly yeah and maybe every exchange on maybe that's just the nature of the medium or maybe that's just the nature of the internet like I mean, I was on, you know, for years I've been on, I was on message boards or listers and it was like not that different, frankly. Yeah. Like flame wars are flame wars and have been since basically the inception of the internet. Yeah. I mean, it was sort of a, a sense of like, look, like people don't talk like that in real life. I right. mean, I, I have never heard someone talk in real life like over drinks the way they do on the message board. And it is a little bit harder to sort of like go off on someone if you know them, you know, at least reasonably personally. And that's something, by the way, that, that it really benefits the right wing and centrists now, right? Like one of the reasons that conservatives get like sort of this endless amount of good faith from the media is because all of them are slapping backs and stuff like that at parties. And I, I wanted to have that, but for the left and like have a sort of understanding of like, yeah, this person is comes at these issues from a different way, but, you know, we can hear him out. I, I found it very useful. I think like there was the recent DSA endorsement uh debate over cynthia nixon and at my happy hour we had like these really awesome discussions about it from people who came from different sides and i think it gave me a really strong sense of perspective on how people were approaching it and that i just didn't see that as much on the on the internet the so the, the reason i want to talk to you is is precisely this because there's a lot of really interesting things i think happening on the left and the center left right now and they get covered sort of sporadically. You know, there was a moment after Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's victory mm-hmm. where there was all this 
attention being paid. She belongs to the Democratic Socialists of America and what is socialism and the parties moving left. And I will say that, that I think the first I heard about her was you. You emailed me to say there's this woman primarying Joe Crowley who's really interesting. You, she's going to come by the happy hour. You should meet her at some point. And I, I started following that race because of that. And I think you, you're 25 years old. You're sort of sitting at an interesting point at the kind of intersection of a lot of these currents that are happening. I think, you know, you used to work for Demos, which is a sort of liberal progressive think tank, but in the kind of institutional vein of the where sure. the Democratic Party or where the progressive movement is at. And then you're, you know, have a lot of interactions with activist groups and also sort of socialists. And so maybe maybe the the best place to start right now is just like, where would you characterize where the base of the left is, what that means in 2018? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are some pretty clear electoral demands um, that come with it, which is, uh, I think, centrally, Medicare for all has emerged as an issue that the progressive left is pretty united around. I think there's no question at this point that if you want to you know, run on the mantle of progressivism, you have to support abortion rights, support a path to citizenship, and often more decriminalization of, of migration. I think that it is increasingly true that you have to support policies that would really tackle inequality in a very serious way. This seems like something of a, a low bar, but you know, if you've observed politics for more than a decade, you would know that this is in fact not a given in the Democratic Party. And for a long time, these were not seen as core values that had to be taken seriously. Well, part of it too, I mean, so there's two things going on here, right? One is this question of like, what is the base or what is the, what, when we're talking about the progressives or left, I mean, there's this always this sort of creeping danger, I think, of like vanguardism, right? Which is like, and I should say, like, you're a young white man, oh. um, which I don't hold against you. I was like, don't hold against me, but but not representative, I think, necessarily of sort of where, you know, the future of the party is. I think we would both agree in a lot of ways. But there's always this question of like, who are we talking about, right? We're talking about like, there's millions and millions of Democratic Party primary voters who counts as the base, who counts as the left. At some level, it's like older black women in the South are some of the most reliable Democratic voters that exist. Like, so in some ways, it's like they're the base in some sort of demographic, you know, who's coming out and voting in election after election. But they're not the people necessarily showing up the Democratic Socialists of America or conference. So, like, how do you think about that? Sure. I mean, I think that what it means to be a progressive is contested now. I think it's it's a debate that we're having within within the party. I mean, there's like sort of a, an old style of thinking about politics, was which was like there's the Democratic position, the Republican position. And then like Ted Kennedy hangs out with like Tip O'Neill or whatever, and they like come up with like here is the bipartisan compromise. And what's changed is now instead you sort of have in the interregnums in which the party is out of power, the various forces that make up that party sort of have – feverish internal debates to determine what is our agenda. Hmm. And then they get power and then they sort of implement that agenda. They attempt right? to ram it through. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so this that, is what happened to the Republican Party. Wait, I, stop right there, because that's an interesting idea. Like that the model to your mind has changed. Right. Yeah. And this is a thing that people lament about the model changing. Right. Yes, because I love like, it. It well, makes me happy. <laughs> I wake up every day and it's the only thing that makes me happy. The idea that like the old model of legislating, which is like we get bipartisan sponsorship, we try to get to like 80 percent of votes, we pass stuff like the the tax reform of 86, which you mentioned Tip O'Neill is like the iconic example sure. of that. That model of legislating is gone. So what you do is you have internal fights within the party for mm -hmm. maximalist positions that you then mm -hmm. try to impose on the opposition. It means you don't have to talk to Republicans anymore. What a relief. What a joy. What a wonder. Uh, yeah. So so I mean, like uh, abolish ice is sort of an internal debate within the Democratic Party, which is when we have the power to create an immigration system, will we create a humane, humanist, human centered immigration system or will we cave once again to the forces of white supremacy? And, you know, the Republican Party has shown itself, you know, many, many times that they do not want to be part of sort of any immigration policy discussion that is not deeply fascist. And I take them at their word for that. And I say, all right, well, then let's come up as the Democratic Party, as this is what we're going to do in 2021. And I think that you can't really use the model that we've had before, because the path to citizenship that we had, you know, a decade ago was far too onerous um, than what we would ideally want. And so I see myself and what I do as is trying to sort of get within the Democratic Party 
and the constituent you know membership of the Democratic Party and the people who vote for Democrats and the people who are invested in the Democratic Party as a as a means to get the policy ends that they want to see as what is an agenda that we can agree on and that we can sort of implement in 2021. But the big question there, right? So where, where the pushback comes, there's a bunch of different ways the pushback comes. So let me tick through them, right? So yeah, one right. of them is, is the Tea Party a good model? I, I, I understand the Tea Party somewhat differently than most people who study this type of stuff do. Power is a, a finite commodity and lots of people want it. And if you want to gain power in the Republican Party, the way you do that is you you exploit the biggest tension between the establishment of the, Demo- the Republican Party and the base of the Republican Party, yep. which is at the time on the issue of immigration. Yep. Power is also a finite commodity on the Democratic side. And when people want to contest for power, they tend to do it in a somewhat different way, which is there aren't really, really huge ideological divides between Democratic primary voters and their elected officials. Um, but there mm. are, you know, pretty big descriptive representation divides. Mm. Um, you have a lot of white men representing districts, the majority people of color. You have a tonal divide um, between mm. sort of the threat that uh, many Democratic primary voters see from Trump in, in the way their re- representatives respond to it. Um, and you do have some interest group divides. Is there a Tea Party left in the sense like there are a lot of people who, um, you know, have a lot of talent and could be in Congress and would like to be and, and at some point I think will be and they will do whatever it takes to get there? Absolutely. I mean, Ayanna Presley is a great example of this. It's just like well, I was slow down. Yeah. Ayanna Presley. Uh, yeah. Who's, she's primary in Capuano. Um, in Massachusetts. Water, Massachusetts 7. Then he's a fine backbencher, you know, and, and he'll make a great professor at Boston University. What her argument, I think, is, is, look, I was on the Hill for 12 years. I was on the city council for eight years. You know, when the fuck's my turn? And no one was giving her a turn, so she's going to she's gonna take her turn. In that sense, like, yes, I would like to see Democratic incumbents face primary challengers because I'd like to see the voters of the Democratic Party have an option between multiple visions for hmm. the future of the party. In a weird way, though, let me stop you there. Because, sure. So there's a few ways to understand what the Tea Party did, right? So one is that you're, I think, putting your finger on, which I think is an important one, right? Which is people forget this about the Tea Party, right? There's like the all of the sort of anti-Obama activism and trying to stop the ACA. But in electoral consequences, a huge its first manifestation were this series of shocking upsets of Republican favorites in primary races, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, just like race after race in which these like Republicans just got like their ass handed to them. And, you know, probably cost them control of the Senate in a few different yeah. elections. Um, you know, some like total gimme seats. Delaware is the one that most comes to mind. We have not seen something like that. Like the what's interesting to me about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ayanna Presley is that we haven't seen more of it. I mean, it seems to me that Democratic primary voters, for whatever reason, are more comfortable, happy with, loyal to the establishment of their party than Republican circa 2010, at least when you look at the sort of results so far. What do you think of that? Sure. I mean, I think that that gets to the other aspect of the Tea Party, which I think is is not helpful for the left, um, which is that it's deeply nihilistic. And fundamentally, nihilism does not serve left aims, though it does serve the aims of the Republican Party, right? Like, if everything in you the mean government like burn it shuts down, down, burn it down, yeah, burn yeah, it down. if everything in the government shuts down forever, like that is a win for the right. It's a win for the Republican Party. That is not true of the Democratic right. Party. It would not be a win for us. And so because of that, I think that the way that the actors think about this electorally is much different. Yep. And, and the reality is, is that the groups who are responsible for giving muscle to these primary challengers have been pretty smart about this. Right. Like there was there's not attempt to to knock off uh, Bresden in the in the Tennessee. There wasn't really an attempt to knock off cinema. You know, there wasn't an attempt to knock off Rosen, though in, in, in the latter two, I do think a, a more progressive person would still be a viable general election candidate. Bresden in Tennessee. Yeah. Cinema, yeah. cinema who is going to be the Democratic nominee for Senate in Arizona, who herself is fascinating because 15 years ago, she might have been sitting in your chair as a young leftist. Uh, she was I, a, is, she I, was a I, Green yeah. Party. She's a Green Party yeah. member who is now like one of the, uh, this centrist member. Of she Congress. fought against the yeah. show me your papers law in the. Arizona State Senate, yeah. and then, you know, basically voted for the same fucking law as a member of the House. <laughs> well, things change. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from you, and I think this is actually, this gets at something really deep about the, the asymmetries between the two coalitions, mm-hmm. is like, I do think because of the nature that Democratic constituencies have to the government, that there is more kind of, for lack of a better word, like pragmatism or more investment in institutional health and success than on the other side. 
Yeah, 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 for sure. And uh, I mean, there, there would be one other difference with the Tea Party, which is that their agenda is wildly loathed. Uh, by the American public and you know the left's agenda is actually quite popular it's worth dividing sort of candidates into sort of two dimensions Uh, one dimension would be sort of ideology and one dimension would be like how good are they of a candidate Mm -hmm. and I think that we tend to think like very extreme ideological candidates also correlates with like being a bad candidate Marco Ruby is a wildly extreme person. I, I, it's, it's really hard for, I think, media people to understand this because they are sort of al- always imbibing their own bullshit. Um, but Marco Rubio believes that women should never be allowed to have abortions. That's an absurd position, but it is, it is what he has stated as his view. That is wildly unpopular. But it seems like a not unpopular position because, like, Marco Rubio is very hot and is treated by the media as, like, a normal person. Like, I keep going back to Todd Aiken and Mark Rubio. They have the same policy views. If they were in the Senate, they would vote for the exact same bills. But one is seen as extreme and one is not. That gives you a sense of sort of the the sort of flexibility of ideology. There's a great study by Christopher Warshaw in which he shows the American public really meaningfully cannot distinguish between the ideology of different politicians. So when you're thinking of ideological effects, what you're really looking at is candidate effects. And it just so happens that people who are good candidates tend to sort of like end up being in ecosystems where they are sort of told, like, here's the ideology. And I think that's why Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's victory was so powerful, was it was like, actually, you can have very out of the sort of mainstream, you know, in finger quotes, of what the media will allow, ideology. Um, and if you're an incredibly compelling and successful candidate, that doesn't matter. Sherrod Brown is is much the same, and as is Tammy Baldwin. Tammy Baldwin wants fucking to end share buybacks and have worker code determination of every corporate board in America. And she's wildly popular in Wisconsin. One thing I've, I'm suspicious of, like you've got this report in which you polled a lot of the left agenda. Like mm-hmm. there's this thing that happens a lot, which is almost kind of a joke, which is that like everyone thinks that their policy preferences are popular, right? Like if only people like did the things that I want to see, then everyone will win elections. Chris, that's not true. <laughs> you look hurt when I say uh, that. Yeah, I have lots of policy preferences that I know to be unpopular. Okay, see, thank you I for wish saying that. that. The center thank you for saying that. that. I don't. Thank you for saying I that. I released a report full of right, it's things true. that I want to do it that I acknowledge out, are unpopular. Just, I'm, I'm turning to your polling on reparations here, <laughs> which you guys hey, pulled. Hey, it's you above guys, water with under 45s. <laughs> you pulled, it's the future. You pulled reparations. Spoiler alert. Not super popular among the whites. We're not going to get big majorities of white people, uh, where, where where am I here? Um, reparations in your polling, the white working class is thirty nine points underwater. That is the white, true. White college educated, it's thirty points underwater. But with working class people of color, it's fifteen points over uh, yeah. plus. And college educated people of color, it's plus five. So uh, yes, you you have you have. I, been, have, I will acknowledge that. However, it is more you're popular. Not, you're than, not urging. You're not urging every Democratic candidate to run on reparations. No, it is more popular though than 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 cutting Social Security, which I, I I I've joked a little bit on Twitter, but I was like, look, if Tom that's Carper, kind of fascinating. Actually. Yeah, I was like, look, if Tom <laughs> Carper wanted to like be in line with American public opinion, he would stop trying to cut Social Security and he would support abolishing ICE. I totally agree that like there are many members of the Democratic Caucus in the Senate whose voting records are more conservative than they sort of would maximally need to be to get re-election, right? But but I want to go back to this ideological question, right? Because it's like, you're saying two things that are in tension, and I think it's not like an easily resolvable thing, which is like, you're pulling on these issue areas, but then it's also like, well, people don't really actually have fixed ideas about ideology, right? And those to me seem in tension. It's like, you can point to polling and be like, well, abolish ICE is more popular than privatizing Social Security. Sure. But like, people say all sorts of stuff in abstract senses around polling, What they really do is sort of form their worldview based on the signals and the back and forth that's happening through the dynamic political process, right? I mean, maybe. I mean, like, one of the policies that we have there is, like, a public option for Internet. I mean, I don't know what argument you could come up with that would make that, like, unpopular for the American public. It seems like it would be very difficult. Stripping pharmaceutical companies of their patents for life-saving drugs and producing, like, generic versions of that. Like, that seems to me like something that, I don't know how big pharma would attack that, but I'm fairly confident like it would be able to stand up to scrutiny. But you know, by the way, I just sure. want to say for your Hit your me. own polling on public internet, this is fascinating. So public internet, you have polling across four different categories. Mm-hmm. It's plus seventy one among Clinton voters, oh, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Plus seventy one. That's you, that's like that's essentially popular. unanimous, right? 
But here's what's more important, more interesting than that. It's plus 15 among Trump voters. Yeah. It's plus 32 among non-voters. So you just say to, you, you, you pull these different groups, you say, yeah. hey, should there be a public option for the internet? And, yeah. and it's a popular idea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It turns out that like the way to win these voters is not, you know, you, you move to the center. It's actually that you sort of take a playbook from the progressive left and start start injecting new ideas that sort of are going to disrupt the way that they're thinking about the two parties. Yeah, for sure. It's like that's that, so that yeah. theory to me is a really interesting one, right? Yeah. And, and and like the idea that the issue space is because I actually think this is something that is that is happening right now among in the world that I think you're closer to than than a lot of folks that I talk to are, where the idea that inject new issues, push on new issues, like abolish ice is a great example, right? So yeah. so abolish ice went from a slogan that you were tweeting a bunch and. A, it's something that the groundwork has been laid by a lot of immigrant groups. For sure. Um, who've been up against ICE during previous yeah, I mean, administrations. I, 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 made the, I made the reference in one article I talked about of, like, if I started tweeting, let dolphins vote, like, and people were like, yeah, you know what? I, I love that idea. We should let dolphins vote. Like, there would be no sort of, like, intellectual or activist infrastructure that they could, you know, hop onto to let dolphins vote. But when people become, <laughs> yeah, I do want dolphins to vote. Like, it, that's like... <laughs> We're pull. It turns I out genuinely we, believe that about, like I'm, dolphins I'm, I'm, will be wait, some. Let like, me. I'm turning the page. Socialist voters. Twenty twenty of your report that has dolphins voting <laughs> at plus forty among Trump voters. Continue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. But the, that that infrastructure was already created by immigration activists uh, doing a lot of work, and so when people became engaged in the idea that we need to sort of dismantle ICE, there were ways that they could engage with that work that was already there like they could be like all right well let's stop data sharing and we actually have those sort of like activist networks set up we have this theory of change set up that we can immediately engage with and all of that really laid the groundwork to make this something that could happen and i i i mean i think everyone who is investing the idea of abolish ice becoming reality owes a immense debt to the to the people who have been organizing around it for for 20 years well and and, and here's what i think is interesting about abolish ice so it it starts out as a kind of sounds like a kind of crazy or radical idea. Mm -hmm. It gets kind of injected into the bloodstream. There's already an infrastructure of immigrant rights groups that have been sort of frontline dealing with ICE day in, day out, pointing out its its problems, issuing reports like the ACLU did about ICE detention under the Obama administration, and exempting for a second whether it's a good policy idea, which I want to put aside for a second, although I would like to engage on it. Well, clearly, you think so. But exempting that for a second, right? It's been wildly politically successful insofar as when you poll Democratic voters now about yeah. ICE, ICE is totally underwater. Yeah. I don't know. I've been I've been uh, drinking with the progressive left for the last five years every Thursday. And I just sort of have like absorbed all these ideas and I sort of just want to put them out there. And I think that if we as a, as a party and as a progressive movement sort of we can actually sort of disrupt right now like how we're viewed and we can sort of change the playing field to be more on our terms and i think that we should sort of really be injecting a lot of these new ideas into the public realm because i don't think we know off the top of our heads you know what the public is ready for and i think that there's an increasing willingness among the general public to take a second look at really left ideas because a lot of the things that have been currently like in the discourse have not been going very well. Okay, but here's, so when I was 24, 25, it was sort of in the teeth of the Bush administration. It was a weird time because it was post 9-11, the politics of the country had sort of gone insane, totally mm -hmm. insane. I mean, you know, Bush was at 90% approval rating. We were about to go to war in Iraq, which was mm -hmm. an absolutely like criminally horrible idea that I opposed and a bunch of people in my yeah. cohort and world opposed. But thank you. That generation of Democrats, Bill Clinton's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. There's a whole generation of Democrats whose sort of defining thing that they experienced was being caught unawares by right wing backlash. Yeah. There's the there's the McGovern loss in sixty eight, mm -hmm. there's amnesty um, amnesty acid and abortion. Amnesty acid and abortion. There's the idea of getting too far left of the populace, the idea of getting caught unaware by right-wing backlash, the idea that, like, you know, all these sort of rights movements of the 60s and, and early 70s pushed and pushed and pushed, and they precipitated the backlash, and it gave us, you know, gave us Nixon, then it gave us Reagan and all this stuff. 
young liberals and leftists, I think, mm-hmm. don't have that same experience. Mm-hmm. What do you say to people that say, like, you are going to screw up the chances for Democrats by essentially pushing too far and the president of the United States is going to is happy to run around saying they want to abolish ICE because he knows that's not popular and you are handing him your version of amnesty ass and abortion. Well, I mean, I mean, I think Clinton ran on amnesty ass and abortion and she ended up winning a popular vote majority. I, yeah, well, that in 275 yeah, yeah. gets you on the subway. Yeah, yeah but. Look, what I'm trying to say is, I, I actually, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> meaning it's worthless. <laughs> I mean, meaning like she won, but like she's not yeah. president of the United States. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so like, I actually deeply understand folks. I actually encourage young people to read a, a book by a young fellow named Thomas Edsel called yes. uh, Chain Reaction. Which is a great book and on I've, exactly this topic. Yeah. And I've been, I've been, I've imbibed the, the book. Um, I talk with Edsel. And I, I understand, like, I understand, like, why older folks sort of are skeptical because, like, it seems to me like it would really be tough to spend your entire political career sort of in the sort of wake of the Reagan revolution and nothing you do can stop you from just being brutally beaten at the ballot box, like, at every chance you get. And every time you think you finally have, like, gotten out of it, like, you get the shit kicked out of you again. Like, that seems like awful um but it's also not the experience that we have with the american electorate now i mean the electorate has has changed um dramatically um in terms of what they are sort of willing to countenance and i think that inequality has made it so that even folks who have incomes you know seventy five thousand a year are really feeling left behind and are, are a little bit more open to progressive left ideas, uh, the attitudes that Partic- Americans hold about about sort of race in America have, have changed dramatically as well. So, so what I'm trying to say is I understand where where those folks are coming from, and I actually really try to empathize with them deeply by sort of understanding the that that time in politics. And what I try to tell them is just like we are not in the same America now, and also that by sort of expanding the sort of ideas that are allowed to be discussed in American politics, I'm actually helping you. In the current status quo, when, you know, we're talking about ICE funding, you know, Paul Ryan goes to Pelosi and says, look, you know, we, we got to increase ICE. And Pelosi says, like, all right, well, you know, we're going to do that because that's what's been going on. That's sort of seen as the the normal outcome. We should I should note here that, that, I, that funding for uh, CBP, uh, border security in the sort of nebulous category, and ICE has been going up year after year yeah, after yeah. year after year. And now, all of a sudden, Paul Ryan's talking to Nancy Pelosi. He's like, look, I'd love to fund ICE as much as the next person, but I got Adrian Espion who wants to destroy the institution. Maybe let's just, like, zero out funding. I think that, cru- I mean, like, look, you saw this with the, the Goodlot bill, where he, he introduced a fascist bill, and then, you know, some of the Republicans introduced, like, a somewhat less fascist bill, and this is called a compromise. It's not a compromise with Democrats. It's a compromise within the Republican conference. One of the things that you talk about a lot and, and shows up in, in Data Progress, which is a organization that you run, I guess? Data for Progress, yeah. Data for Progress, is just like the fact that marginal voters, mm-hmm. particularly young voters, voters of color who are infrequent voters or non-voters, mm-hmm. if you look at their opinions on stuff, they are quite progressive yeah. in their leanings and a huge project for building power for the left should be focusing like a laser on how you engage those people, how you create the structural conditions to turn them out, and how you create the sort of legal regime that will open up the franchise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I see this as as you expand the sort of uh, you know electorate, you expand the sort of political possibilities for progressive policies. And the people who are currently disenfranchised are you know, the people who are going to be most sympathetic to progressive ideas. I mean, there was a study of Medicaid expansion in Alabama, and what it found was that, you know, most of the people who fell into that expansion gap between what we would have gotten and what it currently exists in Alabama um, were, were, were either disenfranchised permanently through felon disenfranchisement or were not registered to vote. Wow. Right. So the people that are in the gap that would have been yeah. benefited are people who ever had their voting rights taken away by felon disenfranchisement or are not registered, and so they don't wield any meaningful political power electorally. Yeah, I mean, this, this is why I'm a big fan of um, calling up your European representatives and having them implement a, a regime of sanctions against the United States until felon disenfranchisement is ended. <laughs> Another popular idea. 
Look, well, I, but, I mean, I think well, people are calling, you know, Collins. It's, it's, I mean, it's great. You should call her. But at the end of the day, you know, who's really going to have your back is it's the French parliament. Yeah, that's that's exactly where people should focus their energy. <laughs> well, there's there's now this year there's a Florida. There's actually this really yep. important fl- fight in Florida that to me it seems like a good example of a frontline fight on this. Florida has one of the worst felon def- disenfranchisement laws in yeah. the country. And that is going to be on the ballot this this fall. Pretty wild that felon disenfranchisement in Florida cost us like three elections, and it took us two decades to figure out that we should. Uh, this is an ex- stop that. This is truly an excellent point. <laughs> I mean, literally, I lived through two thousand, <laughs> yeah. and we saw what happened in yeah. Virginia when they got rid of largely got rid of felon disenfranchisement under McAuliffe, and it it did alter the the, the sort of center of gravity of that state. Yeah, I mean, like. Love y'all for protesting the war, but, you know, could have put some time into that film disenfranchisement. Would have appreciated it. We were very busy back, to, back then trying to stop that war. But but that, to me, sort of strikes me as a place where, like, when you talk about these sort of factional or ideological disputes in the broader center left, mm-hmm. it does seem to me like one place of overlap where, like, everyone lines up. I mean, it's good for everyone across the spectrum, right? I think in some ways is widening the franchise, things like automatic voter registration, getting rid of felon disenfranchisement, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the things where you see the sort of most overlap and it's where it's easiest for folks to organize around. You know, it's one of the reasons I think that Andrew Cuomo is so despised. He's, you know, a governor of New York, governor of a of super blue state. Also, you despised, know, I have to say this, despised by activists on the left, like he's he, sure. he's polling 30 points up in the Democratic primary. I don't want to I don't want to overrepresent wow, that. that view. Me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, look, no, he is just dis- he is absolutely despised by a certain group of, of, yeah, of folks in New York. One of the funniest things people don't know, it's not really funny. It kind of stinks. But, uh, you know, one of the most pro Republican gerrymanders in the country was you know, signed into law by Governor Cuomo. Um, he, he gerrymandered our state Senate to ensure that he wouldn't have to press progressive policies. And I absolutely think that one of the things you see is these very powerful sort of cross ideological within the Democratic Party and progressive movement broadly, um, but often even cross ideological, um, including conservatives. You know, in Alaska, they passed automatic voter registration, and that's a, a very red state yeah. around the, uh, the sort of rights of the franchise. And one of the things that you've seen is when Democrats are taking power in states like uh, Washington and New Jersey, that's one of the first things they're doing. And also, you know, we just ha- saw this in Maryland. And and one of the things that's actually been really frustrating for me to watch is how how rapidly these things have happened. And it's like, you know, wh- why the fuck weren't we doing this like 10 years ago? Like like one of the frustrations I, I really deeply feel as a sort of young progressive is, what, why are the all of our institutions, why have they been failing for so long? Why have we not, why doesn't New York have better voting laws? Like many of the, the leading pro-voting rights groups are based in New York. Like why, what is, what's going on? Like what have y'all been doing with that money? What have y'all been doing with that energy that all of a sudden it's indivisible that's knocking up the W's in states like Maryland? One area where there is asymmetry that is rebalancing is on that because one of the things you saw in 2010 when Republicans took power in states was they attacked the root of progressive power right away. Right. right. So like all of the stuff about collective bargaining and public sector unions and voter ID was about like go after the institutional power of the other side, make us more powerful and them less powerful as a sort of like first priority. Right. And I think what ends up happening to progressives and, and is that there's often a kind of substantive governing agenda that people want to put mm-hmm. first, understandably, because they're like, well, we made these tangible promises on like, we're going to spend more money on education or whatever it is. Yeah. You're, you're older than me. Um, so maybe you can explain this. But like, I, I was looking back at sort of like, what was the sort of, what was, what did we reap from the 2008 and 2010, the fact that we controlled like, you know, two thirds of like the governorships in the country. And it's like genuinely unclear to me. Like it didn't seem like there was Mm. a sort of coherent here is now that we have power, like here is what we're going to do with it. And so you got to the point where like Democrats ended up getting wiped out in, you know, 2010 and Republicans just started like really aggressively implementing this agenda. and, And we were caught on our back foot and we hadn't sort of solidified the gains we made. And it reminds me a lot of sort of Bill Clinton, where the, the the whole Democratic Party agenda was just like, let us maintain reasonably high favorable ratings. And Bill Clinton did leave office pretty popular, but he left without a substantive, you know, governing 
vision that was sort of fulfilled that he can sort of claim you know this is my right. thing it's like genuinely hard to go back and be like what was like leftover from bill clinton that we're like super dope and like down into now um whereas with obama like we we sort of have that agenda like here are the things that he did and you just you had the same thing with the governorships which was just like look as long as we're you know remaining relatively popular we have done our job I think that sort of interestingly tees up, I think, the idea of like the what the sort of ideas primary is for sure. 20, 2020 on the Democratic side. Like amidst the family separation crisis, we saw a bunch of people coming out either with various versions of abolish ice. Mm-hmm. One thing I think that's happened that I think is very interesting is that because that field is going to be so competitive, there's going to be so many people yeah. and people are going to be looking to the left is that you see this kind of like appropriation of phrases where people are like, sure, I'm for Medicare for all, or I'm for abolish ice. And then it's like, yeah. You look at the details and maybe it's just they say that, but that's not really what's going to actually happen. What do you see as like the big th- ticket items that there's going to be kind of consensus around or fights over in this? Well, uh, I mean, you sort of loaded up a question and then went with another one. I mean, I think <laughs> to, to be very clear, I do think that it's good for the left to sort of have our ideas be something that Democrats want to you know, be associated with because it means that we have some mechanism of accountability. You know, a bunch of state legislators and mayors and stuff signed on to a sort of statement that they said, they said, we want to abolish ice. And I'm like, well, motherfuckers, you, uh, you don't, you know, hold the purse strings of the federal government. So you can't, but here are a couple of things you could do to limit the power of ice. Like, why aren't you setting up funds to pay for the legal services of undocumented folks? Uh, why aren't you sort of aggressively limiting data sharing with ICE. You know, why aren't you sort of investigating the uh, circumstances of detention in your backyard? They wanted to be associated with those ideas. And we were able, as the left, I think, to sort of start extracting concessions. Like, if you like our framing and you like our ideas, like, we need a seat at the table. It is true that there is some sense in which I think Democrats are going to try to water down the ideas of the left. And we should contest that, absolutely. But it's unabashedly good, from my perspective, that the Democratic Party wants to uh, be associated with those ideas because it gives us the ability to sort of define what those ideas are and hold them accountable. And so to the second part of your question, which is what are the ideas that are sort of coming up and, and getting big? You know, I think we've seen a good number of presidential contenders come out in favor of uh, some form of a job guarantee. The idea that the public sector has much more of a role to play in labor markets. I tend to think of the job guarantee something as like a public option for employment, Hmm. a sort of way out of an abusive private sector labor market that is increasingly defined by monopsony, which is the idea of a few large employers who have the ability to set wages, um, which, you know, could explain why we're not seeing wages increase. I think that on immigration, there's going to be a a pretty rapid move left. I think that abolish ICE is sort of the first big thing, but I think that you're going to start to see people sort of contesting what that path to citizenship is going to look like. I think a 10 year long path to citizenship that includes, you know, paying back taxes is very onerous and also is something that, you know, President Trump 2.0 could reverse. So you really have to get a path to citizenship that's a little bit shorter and I think less onerous. And I think that there's going to be some activism around that. I think that decriminalizing migration broadly is going to be a big issue. I think things like ending cash bail, um, you've seen both um, Kamala Harris and um, Bernie Sanders introduce legislation on that. I think that ideas, even bigger ideas, things like an idea of a universal basic income or a universal basic wealth will actually begin to emerge. And I also think that you're going to start to see public options for everything be a thing that people are thinking of. Like, Mm. We need a more robust role for a government in providing, you know, why why don't we have a public option for banking? Why do we have, you know, one quarter of our population is on banks? Why can't they go to the Federal Reserve or their post office and open up a bank account? I think that you're going to see a really big increase in progressives contending that there are increasing numbers of domains of life that the government should be involved in. And so when I say public option for everything, I mean that that means public option for college, public option for child care. I think public option for health care. All of those are going to become things that are on the agenda. In that argument, 
that you want to have that that the like the big arrow in your quiver is is the ACA, right? Because like when it came down to it, the two big parts of the ACA, which was Medicaid expansion, which was like the brute force expansion of the public sector, right? This is public provision oh, yeah. of, of, of health care that we're going to expand. And the exchanges, which was the Rube Goldberg mechanism to like get into the market and regulate it in certain ways and make incentives and you have tax credits and yada, yada. Like it's pretty clear politically, like again, aside from the policy, like what was popular? The Medicaid expansion. <laughs> like yeah. the, 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 the states that had the Medicaid expansion did not climb down from it. Now, there's huge fights in other states about Medicaid expansion, but that that did seem to be the more politically popular part of the entire enterprise. I mean, I think you know the famous example in the stimulus where like all the economists were like, make sure that people don't know you're getting them the, the tax credit because if they know that they're getting it, then they're not going to spend it. And it's like, no, make them fucking know so they know to vote for you again instead of the people who are going to give all the money to corporations. Um, I, don't, I mean, like, look, I'm not trying to, like, love on Victor Orban. I'm not, like, Steve King over here. But, like, one thing I read that was interesting was... This, he, is, the, this is the uh, president of Hungary yeah, right now, who's a sort of right-wing nationalist and yeah. extremely controversial figure in the EU. Yeah, he's, he's a piece of shit. Um, <laughs> but he he uh, nationalized the energy industry, and every every receipt that you get, it sort of says, like, here's what we saved you, like, by nationalizing it. Like, let's do that. Like, let's do generic drugs. And, you know, whoever the president is... You know, it's just going to have their fucking big old shiny face right on it. And it's like, <laughs> here's your drugs given to you by <laughs> Gillibrand Corp, the uh, section of the government, you know, that the Democratic Party is now nationalized. We need to sort of like think very concretely and very coherently about how are the policies that we are implementing affecting people's lives and in a tangibly yes. connected way to yes. the policy, because I think yeah. you're right that like one of the obsessions of the kind of Democratic Party wonk class yeah. for a very long time was like the minimally invasive intervention to produce the outcome so that no one knew you'd done it. Yeah. And it turned out that's like a, a kind of a bad way to do politics. Right. Because like, again, the non Victor Orban example of this is the check that people got from the Bush tax cuts where there was like an actual check that said like, thanks to the, you know, whatever the act was signed by President Bush, here is your check. Like it was very straightforward. Yeah, they should have done the stimulus checks with just like Obama's face, just like yeah. right on there. And also then a lot of Republicans wouldn't have cashed it in. So it's perfect <laughs> it's because like- to money. <laughs> exactly. There you go. But no, like that, that's exactly right. And I mean, like, look, some of my best friends are economists, but y'all got to have a little less influence over policy and also lawyers. Um, I actually talked to a lawyer once and I- <laughs> I told him I, I thought lawyers should have less influence over policy, and he said to me, "Yeah, but do you want economists?" And I'm like, "God, is, is the, can we have it so it's not lawyers or economists? Like, can that can is, we have people you have described who are not those two? You've described <laughs> the one class of the Democratic Party. Um, Sean McElwee runs Data for Progress. He is uh, I don't know how to describe. How should I describe you? Jackass of all trades. Jackass of all trades. Our most foul mouthed guest here. Oh, really? Uh, I oh. feel like I was being good. You had Jesus, no. <laughs> Matt is shaking his head. <laughs> we'll put the explicit tag on this one. Um, you can follow his work. Uh, he's got a Twitter handle that we'll put up on the website. And uh, if you have uh, questions for him or you want to follow up in the conversation, um, you could always email us at withpod at gmail.com. We can uh, loop Sean in on those. Sean is also a contributing writer at The Nation. Uh, it was great to have you on, man. Oh, right, anytime. I want to thank Sean McElwee for coming on the program, even if he cursed a lot. Um, we decided not to bleep him because that would be annoying and lame. But also, like, you know, I don't know what the but also was. As always, we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, you can always get in touch with us by tweeting us the hashtag with pod. That's W-I-T-H-P-O-D. Or email us at withpod at gmail.com. We actually got a few emails uh, in response to our interview with Mehdi Hassan about Brexit. Uh, one from Joyce. And Joyce says, uh, asks this, any one of the cast of characters in Britain connect into oligarchs or was cy Russian cyber campaign meddling in Brexit the only form of that influence? Um, so it's a great question. There is a lot of reporting about the Russia connection to the Brexit campaign. We know that the Kremlin was invested in it. We know that some of the same kind of... Um, troll farms like the Internet Research Agency were pushing pro-Brexit messages. There's also some reporting on connections between some of the key people pushing Brexit and connections to Russian oligarchs or Russian money. None of that is like completely definitive. It's certainly not definitive in any criminal sense, but there are connections there people are looking at. And what, what is clear, zooming out, is yes, what, was, what did Moscow want? <laughs> 
in, in the case of both Brexit and Trump. In both cases, like, yes, they wanted Brexit. They wanted Trump. That is very clear. That was their preference. And they did things to try to bring that about. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In team and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to NBCNews.com slash why is this happening?